Amen. All right. Can you encourage these folks? Amen. We're going to ask you to open up your Bibles this morning to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter number 1. 2 Peter chapter number 1. If you'll go with me there. 2 Peter chapter number 1. We want to begin reading this morning. Um, well, let's just begin reading with verse number 1, okay? The Bible says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins." Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you again for this opportunity to be in your house. Thank you for your holy word. I pray that you will forgive me of my sin. I ask that you will make me the teacher, the preacher, the pastor that you've called me to be. I pray, Holy Father, that you will cause me to say exactly what you want me to say in the way you want it said. And please keep me, Lord, from saying things that I shouldn't. In the wonderful name of your Son, Jesus, I pray. Amen. And you may be seated. If you have been uh, watching on YouTube or if you have been uh, faithful to our Sunday morning services, you know that we have been uh, looking into uh, the life of Peter a lot this year. Uh, studying him has helped me, been very helpful to me. And one of the things that I want to draw your attention to once again is that these letters, the first letter and the second letter of Peter, were written after his conversion. These letters were not written while he was following Jesus around. Jesus has died. Jesus has resurrected from the dead. The day of Pentecost has taken place. There's been some passing of time. And, and Peter has gone through what we were talking about from Scripture, where he went through what the Scripture references as his conversion. It was actually the sifting of Satan that brought conversion. And Peter has written these letters. So you're receiving a letter inspired by the Holy Spirit from a man who has been through some things. And here's what he's encouraging us to do. And we talked about this last week. We talked about the subtraction and the addition. We talked about the simple math. We, we, you could say it this way, the simple math of Christianity. Things to subtract 
And now we're talking about the things to add. And this is where we want to pick up again this morning. We want to look at verse number five. He says, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. Now, the first thing that we want to acknowledge this morning is this, is that these are additions. The list of things that we can read here are additions to an existing faith. The faith already exists. It's already present in the person's life. We don't do these things so that we might have faith. We do these things because there is already an existing faith. Everybody got that? We're adding to an existent faith. These things do not bring about faith, nor do they make our faith stronger per se. They are behaviors that are to be added to our faith. And here's the thing. Faith does not automatically produce these actions as some might think. When we look at this passage of Scripture, it says we're supposed to add to our faith virtue. And some would think, okay, I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, now I'm virtuous. Some would say, I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, so now I'm patient. I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, so now I'm kind. Right? We got saved, and now we're perfect. Amen. Wouldn't that be great? Ah, it's just not true. See, you can take any one of these actions and think it should happen automatically after we put our faith in Jesus, but in reality, it doesn't happen that way. We do not automatically become those things, virtuous, kind, patient, just because we've put our faith in Jesus. But these things can be now added to our life because we have put our faith in Jesus. The wonderful thing about what's going on here is we are adding to a saving faith We're adding to saving faith. Anything not added to saving faith is actually self-righteousness. It's actually not healthy and can sometimes get in the way. Y'all, I forget, you know, my microphone's going in and out, so just bear with me today that, that we can't do anything about that. So don't even blame the sound booth, okay? We're just having problems. They're trying to get me to buy some more equipment. I'm holding out. Amen. We do not do this automatically. Here's what we do. We add this to this word faith. Let's define faith. This word faith is persuasion. That is credence. That is moral conviction of religious truth or truthfulness of God or a religious teacher, especially reliance upon Christ for salvation. We are learning that this is coming from a primary verb to convince by argument. We're not just talking even, we're not even just talking about the kind of faith that you're exercising now per se. You're exercising faith right now, right? You came in, you sat down. What did you do? You put your faith in that chair, right? And you probably put your faith in that chair because quite possibly you've sat in that chair before and it didn't let you down the last time, probably won't let you down this time. You may have looked around the room and you you said, okay, that's a pretty good sized fella over there. If that chair will hold him up, it'll hold me up. But this is something else. This is this, that that's faith. But there's also this reality that this faith has come by persuasion. Something has transpired. There has been, we could say it this way and rightfully so, there has been a wooing, there has been a convincing, there has been a convicting. We are talking about saving faith. The Holy Ghost of God has done a work in your life concerning the area of faith and who you're going to trust If you'll go with me to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. While you're turning there, I'll read to you a verse 
It says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, For the which cause I also suffer these things. This is the Apostle Paul writing to a young preacher. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he, talking about Jesus, is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. This is the faith that we're talking about. I have put my faith in Jesus. I have put my faith life in his hands. I have put my hope on him. You understanding this? Now, here's what we understand then. Ephesians 2, 8 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith. This kind of faith. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. This faith is the gift of God. You don't muster it up. You don't don't stir it up. It is the gift of God. God gives you this faith. Amen. It is the gift of God. And verse number 9 of Ephesians 2 says, Not of works, lest any man should boast. We're not talking about your faith in your ability to do good. We're talking about you have put your faith in the only one who is good. Amen. Amen. For those that are still with me, right? I've put my faith, you've put your faith in the one who could save you. Amen. How did I do that? It was a gift. God gave me that faith. And thank God, I, by God's grace... Put it back in Jesus. God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Go with me to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Here's the reason that you are here this morning. I hope it's because you have put your faith in Jesus or The faith that God has given you is stirring in you and you are looking where to put it. Amen. But you have been given that. You have been given that. You have been given the measure of faith. Romans 10.8 says this. Romans 10.8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. There is something, when it comes to being a believer in Jesus Christ, it's not, it, it, the, the Word of God is doing a good job of explaining it, thank God. But we experience it even without even necessarily being able to explain it. All I know is this, is that we have been given faith that belongs in Jesus We have been given faith that belongs on Jesus. That if thou, look at what it says in Romans 10, 9. In verse 8, it says, in thy heart. It says, this word of faith is in my mouth. This word of faith is in my heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Saved from wrong. Saved from the punishment of sin. Saved from the penalty of sin. And eventually saved from the presence of sin. But even in this life, dear friend, we can be saved from the power of sin. Sin does not have to run our lives. Amen. Amen. It says this in verse number 10. So for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It is this miraculous thing, this, this miracle faith 
that connects my intellect and my emotion. It connects my mind and it connects my heart. And my heart and my mind connect and they are not double-minded. My heart isn't believing one thing about Jesus and my mind believing something else about Jesus. My mind believes it about Jesus and my heart believes it about Jesus. And here's what I do. I repent and trust Jesus. Everybody got it? I hope. If you haven't trusted Jesus with your head and with your heart, you can. You've been dealt the faith. He's dealt it to every man. I'm no big deal because I've trusted Jesus. All I've done is trust Jesus. Is everybody getting this? Faith then is the gift from God that has given to every that is given to every human being. God has given us a resting place for our faith. Romans 10:13. Romans 10:13 says this, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The Lord deals deals to every man a measure of faith. And then what happens is that person, that woman, that child, that man, that that, that boy, they, they hear the word of God. And now all of a sudden they have a resting place for their faith. It's, it's a miraculous thing. This word of God is powerful. It's alive. The Word of God has power. You know what it is? It is a catalyst to faith. People have received the gift of the faith, but here's what happens. When they hear the Word of God, when they read the Word of God, they're like, oh my, something is going on inside of my mind and something is going on inside of my heart. Are you with me? There is this belief thing The Word of God is the catalyst for our faith. When our ears hear God's Word or when our eyes read God's Word, it does something to the faith we have received. The Word of God affects our hearts. It affects our faith. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says this, For the Word of God is quick, meaning alive, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God will slice and dice. The Word of God will deal with your heart. It will cut through the camouflage and get to the root cause. The Word of God will separate what people think from what their heart wants to believe. Are you with me? There have been countless, 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 countless skeptics that have went and said there is no God and then someone challenged them to prove it with God's Word. Then they read God's Word and the more they try to disprove God's Word, the more they become a believer. Some of the most quote unquote, which I struggle with this, calling them intellectuals because the Bible said the fool have said in his heart there is no God. But anyway, some of the most intellectual people have have approached this issue of the reality of Jesus Christ, the authenticity of the Word of God, does God exist? And so many of them, if they will actually get into the Word of God, Atheists get saved when they get into the Word of God. It's powerful. It divides. I remember one of our dear friends who is now attending another church. He used to go to church here. He accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. He came up to me and said, you have no idea what an atheist I once was, but now I've trusted Christ. One of the things that he used to do as an atheist is every Christmas he would take a crucifix, take a cross, and hang Santa Claus on it and set it on his desk. Horace, right? Santa Claus on the cross? What was his point? He's like, you're getting upset over that? 
And you're not really bothered with the fact that Jesus hung on a cross? You see what I'm saying? He was cynical, man. He was tough. But you know what he is now? He's saved. He's saved. Why? Because he got in God's word. So look at what it says in Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. This is the Lord speaking through his prophet Isaiah. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing where I sent it. Where to I sent it. It's a promise from God that His Word will accomplish what He sent it to accomplish. I remember years ago visiting a, a frail little preacher in the mountains of West Virginia. And he, she says, come, let, let me show you my print and press. I thought we were going to go back into this little area where he was printing maybe the church bulletin on a weekly basis. You know, I thought, oh, he's going to show me his cute little print and press where he prints the church bulletin. He opened up the door and there was a printing press and all these copies of the Bible in multiple languages that his little church there in West Virginia had been printing and distributing all over the world. And he looks at me and he said, and, he, and, he, and I get choked up thinking about what he said to me because it changed my life. This little frail preacher looks at me, he's probably about 89 years old at the time. He looks at me and says, Chris, sometimes me and you say the wrong thing, but the Word of God never does. And since that time, I have no idea how many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of copies of the Gospel of John and the Book of Romans have been distributed from that little printing operation. Who knows how many have accepted Christ? I do know this. I know I took a box from him. And I know what I did. I went back to Tennessee and I just started passing them out. Handing them out. And I know one day I went and knocked on a lady's door to ask her to come to church. I knocked on the door and I said, ma'am, I'm Chris Grinstead. I'm from Fellowship Baptist Church down here in Ridgetop, Tennessee. Just wondering if you had a few minutes to talk. And then I asked her, I said, if you died today, do you know where you'd go? And she looked at me and says, I used to think I did. She goes, hold on just a minute. And she went running back to her back uh, bedroom and brought back out one of those John and Romans that I had just been... And she goes, I used to think I was good with God. I used to think that I was okay. I used to think I was a good person until I read this. And she had highlighted all of these verses in that John and Romans. The Word of God was doing a work. She trusted Jesus as her Savior, got baptized, and several of her family members. What are you, what are you bragging on? I'm, I'm bragging on the Lord. I'm bragging on the Word of God. I'm bragging on what the Word of God does. I'm bragging on the reality that the Word of God is the catalyst for your faith. If you want your faith to grow, you got to get in the Word of God. Amen. Amen. First Peter, First Peter 1 Peter 1.22 says this, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God which liveth and abideth forever. The Word of God is an incorruptible seed that lives and abides forever and it can be sowed into your soul and it will spring forth eternal life. The Word of God is the catalyst for our faith. We've been given faith. But now let's understand what Peter's saying. He's saying that faith, you need to add to it. Add to your faith. The word add simply means to furnish besides. That is fully supply. That is aid or contribute. That is minister or nourishment. Some Bible versions use the word supplement. It's, this is saying that you need to supplement your faith with, and it gives you a list of things here. Supplement your faith. There needs to be an addition Verse number 8 of 2 Peter chapter 2 says this, For that righteous man dwelling among them, seeing and hearing, look at what it says, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Lot. And we're going to take the next few minutes here, and I want us to go back and I want us to look at Lot's story. I want you to go back to Genesis chapter number 13. In Genesis chapter 13, we're doing well on time. In Genesis chapter 13, 
If you're with me, say amen. amen. Do I need to make you stand up again? No. no. Genesis chapter 13. It says this, And Abram went up out of Egypt. If you know the story of Abraham, he's called out by God in chapter 12. He brings with him his nephew Lot. And Abram went up uh, out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and in gold, and he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel unto the place which his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife. I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and there separated themselves the one from the other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Some of you know the story of Lot. Peter makes this reference to Lot in the second chapter, in the, in the, in the first chapter of, of his letter, of his second letter. He's talking about adding these things. Then he goes on to say, these are the blessings if you add these things. But then he goes on to say, if you don't add these things, as we've read earlier this morning, you will forget that you were ever purged from your sins. He says that. And then he goes on into the second chapter and begins to use examples. And he uses the man by lot and he says this. He says, that just man vexed his righteous soul. Vexed it. Now, what does that word vex mean? It means it, it, it means that that it it, 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 it was it sickened, for lack of a better word. It sickened his soul. It was if he was living in a world where everything, listen very carefully, where everything should be good. Why? Because there was a lot of water for his cattle. His cattle were increasing. We'll see a little bit later that he's starting to move up in the politics and the prominence of the town. Everything should have been good. But you want to know what was wrong? There was something wrong with his soul. His soul was still vexed. His soul was still sick. His soul wasn't joyous. His, jo his soul wasn't one. It wasn't well with his soul. We sing this song, it is well, it is well with my soul. I pray that it is well with your soul. But here's what I understand. A person can have a righteous soul that is vexed. It's not full of joy. It's honestly, it is not well with the soul. How? Well, Lot had began to acquire herds and tents. Look at verses 1 through 5. It's not necessarily wrong to have herds and tents. You want to know why? Because Abram, Abraham had herds and tents. The herds and the tents aren't the problem. Abraham had herds and tents. Abraham is classified in verses 1 through 5 as being rich. Lot isn't classified as being rich. In the comparison to Abraham, Lot wasn't rich Maybe he wanted to be rich. Maybe he was comparing, I do not know. But here's what we understand. He had herds and he had tents, but he was not described as rich. Now, isn't that interesting? 
How can you have herds and how can you have tents and how can one person be described as rich and another person be described as rich and not rich or not, not described as rich? There's a, something that can happen to a person once they get herds and tents. If it's not kept in the proper perspective, the truth of the matter is it becomes more of a burden than it does a blessing. If a person doesn't understand why they have received the herds, why they have received the tents, as we move on down, you still with me? As we move on down, Abram went back to the altar. Look at verses 3 and 4. Verses 3 and 4, And he went on his journeys from the south, uh, even to Bethel, talking about the house of bread, the house of God, the house of prayer, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ham. Here's what Abraham does. Abraham, listen very carefully, he left in Genesis chapter 12. Along the way, he's, required, he's acquired more tents and herds. But where does he go with his tents and his herds? He goes back to his starting place. He goes back to the place where he is going to offer up a sacrifice to God. He knew why he had herds. No amens. That's okay. It might be that you just didn't understand what I just said. Okay, think about it for just a few minutes. You got Abraham who is defined as rich, tents and herds. You've got Lot not defined as rich, but he's got tents and herds. They've got so much that they can't dwell together. What's the difference? One man still had a solid, close relationship with God. It's been said that Lot was connected to Abraham and Abraham was connected to God. Lot needed to be connected to God. A lot of people living off of grandma's faith. And what's sad is when grandma dies, they quit church. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I got to move on. See, here's what ha happened. Abraham went back to the altar. Abram called on the name of the Lord. There is no mention of Lot doing this. Does Lot go with him? Yes, he goes with Abram. But it doesn't mention, him, mention Lot calling on the name of the Lord. You can receive the blessings of God and all those blessings do is take you further away from your love for God. You can legitimately start loving the blessings more than you love the blesser. Amen. It can happen. Lot had began to acquire herds and tents. Abram went back to the altar. Abram sought peace. Lot sought further prosperity. Verses 6 through 11, it records that Abram says, Don't let there be strife between me and you. Don't let there be strife between our herdmen. This isn't Lot bringing peace. This is Abraham bringing peace to the situation. And Abraham is so confident in God. He says, You go to the left, I'll go to the right. You go to the right, I'll go to the left. Abraham is in a relationship with the God who blessed him. He is not in a relationship with the blessings. You do what you're going to do, and I'll go do what I'll do the opposite. That way we can get along. Well, then, the, then, then what happens? When you look, it says that Lot saw the plains. Verse 9 is not the whole land before thee. Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. And Lot, verse number 10, lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere. He looked at what was going to bless his blessings. He looked at what was going to increase his cattle production. What was going to make his business better. There is no prayer. There is no sacrificing. That isn't, there is no counseling with God. He moved on what he saw. Abraham goes on and gets blessed in the land of Canaan. Where does Lot? Lot finds himself in the city. Look at what he does next. Verses 12 through 13. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Here's what happened. Lot pinched his tent toward the wicked. He put his tent in the direction of the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Where... Where you, where, you, where you set your gaze is where you're going. 
Where you, where you, friend, where you are directing your life is where it will end up. Where you are headed is where you're headed. Where are you headed? And where are your children headed? The Bible is plainly teaching us this morning from the book or the second letter of Peter that we have got to add some things to this faith. The faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that is what has justified us. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ has justified us. That is what made us righteous. But we are supposed to add things to this faith if we do not. And he uses the example of Lot. A righteous man vexing his own soul. Making his own soul sick. Well, I've done this, I accomplished this, and I thank God for it. I know God sent me in this direction. I know God blessed me. Well, hallelujah, praise God. Everything's okay. Well, I got to make some decisions. What am I going to do? Am I going to uh, honor God or, or am I, I going to lean in? Well, it'll be okay just to lean in this time. And then it leads to another time. There's all kinds of reasons why to put whatever comes in front of God in front of God. And the end result is this, a vexed soul. And we end up one day wondering why in the world can we not be happy in this world? We're saved, right? We're blessed, right? Everything that Lot was. You still with me? See, where we set our family. Where is your family? What does your, I'm going to say it like this. What does your son, what does your daughter, what do your children, what do your grandchildren, who do they really love? Love. Look what takes up most of your time. What takes up most of their time. I'm telling you. People have got their tents set in the wrong direction. And here's what's going to happen. It's going to end in a sorry, sorrowful, sick soul. It's going to happen. It's just going to happen. Lot pinched his tent toward the wicked. He ends up with the wicked. If you go to Genesis chapter 19, flip over a few pages, Genesis chapter 19... He's looked at the plains and wanted prosperity. He then pitched his tent toward the city. And then in Genesis chapter 19 and verse number 1, And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and the angels were coming to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. You know what that means? He was in the place of prominent business. When you sat in the gate, it means that you had risen in popularity and prominence. You were one of those who took care of the business affairs of the city. The United States of America is not going to get saved by the president who has the best fine. The one of the thing, if there's anything, let's let me talk about America for just America. America's soul is vexed. She got started the right way. There was prosperity. And now all it has led to is immorality, perversions, murder of children. And now we think that the person who's got the best financial plan for our country is who needs to get our vote, no matter anything else. America's soul is vexed. There's a lot of Christians whose souls are vexed. Do you want to know why? Go back with me. Go back with me. I'm trying to bring it to a close. Go back with me to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2. Verse number 8. Look very carefully. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. 
You want to know what was vexing Lot's soul? What he was seeing and what he was hearing. Christians in America, our souls are vexed. Why? Because what we are seeing and what we are hearing. Some of the things that we are hearing, we are not hearing it by choice, but it's there now. Some of the things that we're seeing, we're not seeing it by choice, but, but it's there now. The sad, 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 sad truth is that many Christians are liking what they're hearing and agreeing because they've been hearing it for so long. Some are now choosing to watch things, saying that it's okay what they're seeing, what they're looking at. They're doing it by choice now. Christians doing it by choice. And here's the end result, a vexation of soul. Sick, 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 sick soul. Makes the soul sick. Well, if I die, I'm going to go to heaven. Yes, you are, but you could be enjoying the trip. Amen. Lot pitched his tent toward the wicked. Then Lot ended up living among the wicked. Lot sat in the gate. This is significant. He stayed in a place where his soul was being vexed. Why would he stay in a place where, he was so, where his soul was miserable? Why would he stay in it? Because it cost too much to leave it. He began to love it. Began to love it. See, here's what happened. Many of you know the rest of the story. Here's what happens. The angels are going to destroy the city. They're getting Lot out and he struggles with leaving and they had to grab him and drag him out. His wife began to love Sodom and Gomorrah. His wife loved Sodom and Gomorrah. You want to know how much? So much that on their way out, she couldn't help but turn and look back. What happened to her? She was turned into a pillar of salt. His two daughters had been so corrupted by what they saw and what they heard in Sodom and Gomorrah, they thought it was a good idea. They ran to a cave to, to hide from the destruction. Lot and his two daughters, and they were so corrupted in their thinking that they thought it was a good idea to get their dad drunk and then to have sex with him. And that's what they did. This is in your Bible. And they both got pregnant by their dad. Who did this happen to? A man with a righteous soul that was vexed. According to Peter... And Peter says, that's why it's so important that you add these things. Amen. You make a conscious effort, and we're closing. You make a conscious effort, what? Effort, what? You got saved. Jesus saved you. Hallelujah. He gave you the faith. You heard the word. You have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. No one is saying that you haven't. But may I ask you a question, my dear friend? Have you added to your faith virtue? Virtue. Are we living our Christian lives with the spirit of abstinence rather than indulgence? Are we living in our are we living our lives with the spirit of by God's grace I am going to abstain. This this word virtue means courage. This word virtue means maturity. This word virtue means excellence. One might say it this. It's mature. It's adding to your faith maturity and moral excellence. To where your goal is to Live for Jesus, which means you stop the wrong and start doing the right. A conscious decision is made. You as a Christian, thank God, can do that. You have been given the faith and you can add to your faith virtue. So can I. If you don't, I'll tell you where you're going to end up. You're going to end up forgetting that you've been purged from your old sin. Many times a Christian will run right back 
to what they were delivered from. A Christian, yeah, they'll go right back to what they were delivered from. And I'm telling you, it's a horrible, horrible sight. Horrible. But it don't have to be that way. I'm going to close with this. Friends, when we accept Jesus as our Savior, many of us strive to stop doing certain things. But we don't necessarily strive to add. Because there's a list here. Virtue, knowledge. We had a little competition the other night, and I went up there and I went blank. Right? Over at uh, Family Huddle. One of the questions was to name these. I was elected to do it, and I failed. I got the first two this morning, though. Virtue. Knowledge. Adding these things. Well, I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Hallelujah. I'm not going to go to hell when I die. I got my get out of hell free ticket card. And hallelujah, I agree. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. You do. But how's your soul? Is it vexed? Add. Add to your faith. Virtue, make the right decisions. Don't point your tent toward Sodom. And do not let the blessings of God dictate your decisions. Do what is right with God, not what is right for you to get more stuff. If you're found in that situation. You, you may never be found in that situation, but if you're found where you have to choose between the two, choose, choose Jesus. Father, you know how hard it has been for me to study this passage of Scripture because of your wonderful conviction on my own life. Oh, Father, I think about my carnal mind and how that it is the enemy of you. Oh, God, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. I get drawn away so easily I look uh, at things of this world and they have a, an attraction to me. And I, I pray, holy God, that you would forgive me. But I thank you, Lord, that you are showing us here this morning that you have given us the faith. And now these things can be added. Help me and help my wife. Help this church. Lord, even those that are attending maybe for the first time today, Lord, help us all to make the right choice. There may be someone here today who needs to just trust Jesus, that their, their faith has found a resting place in you, and they need to ask Jesus to save them. There's others here, Father, who are, have trusted Jesus as their Savior, but they are not adding virtue they're not adding help me help us oh father that our souls would not be vexed with what we're seeing and what we're hearing in the name of your son Jesus I ask this I ask it Lord sincerely ask you to intervene in Jesus name we're going to stand to our feet.